that make them is there's a bar at the base of the tail and often paired eyes at the head. And that's replicated in the birds as well. Unfortunately, with continued development of the area, it ha is threatening that the very essence of the area. And I would hope that governments, both state and national, come to their senses and recognise the world heritage significance of this location and protect it. So how exactly is the rock art being destroyed? Uh, well, you, in two ways. You have the actual footprint of industry that is destroying the landscape that the rock art sits in, and then the second element is the emissions effect on the rock art. That it, at, at, Yet we don't have a handle on how bad that is, but Robert Bednarik, as his graph he showed, indicated the potential for loss of the images because of the emissions. In, people have said the emissions are no worse than any capital city. The trouble is we're not in a capital city, we're in an arid coastal environment. Emissions of a city level should not be there. My favourite comment is this one. I need to uh, perhaps explain a little about what Professor Hagelia from Norway means when he talks about acids. Uh, you may have noticed that all of the petroglyphs have been produced by hammering through the dark brown patina that covers all rock surfaces in arid Australia. If somebody was to come along and pour acid over this surface, it would remove the mineral accretion. In, the, in, the, in, the, in that process, it would also remove any petroglyphs that happen to be on the surface. It would effectively destroy the rock art. I would like you to look very closely at this photograph. You will notice that the original rock color, this, color, this rock is actually colored gray. It's, co it's coated by this deposit, which we call a patina. But under the tree, it has actually been removed by acid. See so massive emissions at the uh, roadside, 11,000 tons of nitric oxides per year. That's a quarter of a million tons since, since the plant came into operation. It's blanketing the surface with, this, with these emissions. What, co what goes up has to come down and comes down everywhere within about 100 uh, kilometers radius. You will find that all vegetation has caused this, this effect. What happens is that the acidic uh, materials are deposited on all of the surface, but on the rock, they uh, are deposited on a, on a two-dimensional surface. In the canopy, in the forage of the tree, they are deposited in three-dimensional space, and when they become activated by precipitation, they are projected onto a two-dimensional space a two-dimensional two uh, surface, in other words, become quite concentrated. So what we have here is actually an advance warning of what's going to happen to the rest of the rock surfaces. In 2003, following intense lobbying, the Western Australian state government established the Rock Art Monitoring Committee to investigate the possible impact of industrial emissions of the rock art. The committee, chaired by Associate Professor Frank Murray, released preliminary results in late 2005. The impact on the rock art is yet to be determined. Results are expected in the next few years. Preliminary work suggests that the levels of air pollution immediately adjacent to the borough um, for most of the gases are reasonably low. My talk is probably incorrectly titled. It should be the recent background or even the very recent background, given the uh, archaeological information that we've been shown this morning. Uh, clearly, I'm only going to talk about what the white community since settlement has done to the borough and why. Uh, and I think that provides uh, some information to pick up Tom's refrain. This shows the status of the different types of land that we have in the area and it illustrates why the Barup is, is such a complex issue. This land outlined in yellow is essentially land vested in the Conservation Commission. This light tan colour is land which is proposed to be freeholding to the Aboriginal people under the Barup Maitland Agreement. That yellow and brown land constitutes the great majority of the Barup. The blue is the existing industry leases on the borough that have been there in most part since the 1960s. The purple colour uh, represents the 
the new industry precincts which are reflected in the Burrup Maitland Agreement. This area now contains, as is someone else's estimate, I think it was the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, they this area contains something like $35 billion worth of investment and is responsible for many thousands of jobs, probably six to 7,000 direct jobs and many more in the community and a large part of the economic activity that happens here in Perth. It also is responsible or hosts something like half of West Australia's exports. It's the uh, second busiest port in a tonnage basis in Australia. The busiest being in Port Hedland, just to the east. The complex balancing act between the multiple interests of industry, heritage, native title, recreation and the environment has seen the Dampier Archipelago subject to a number of land use planning processes. Through these processes, 38% of the place has been set aside for industrial development and a number of management plans have been or are in the process of being developed. Despite all these initiatives giving recognition to the heritage values of the Dampier Rock Art Precinct, over 4,000 pieces of rock art have been destroyed since records were kept in 1972. Woodside Petroleum, in their most recent development proposal, Pluto, concedes that they will need to relocate or destroy rock art. The National Trust has nominated the place to the National Heritage List, seeking federal government protection of the place. So is there a solution, do you think? There is a solution. Whether we're going to achieve it is not. We're trying for a win-win solution. Um, I know that's rhetoric. It's often used a lot. The, basically, the National Trust position is this. We have one holistic management plan for the entire precinct. Currently, there are seven. Secondly, we have one dedicated management fund, which is made up from contributions from industry, state government, and federal government. That is not being done. Secondly, we have, a, or thirdly, we have an independent monitoring group set up away from government and government agencies to oversee the management plan. And finally, we have a dedicated time frame for management plan, which, by the way, includes an inventory of what's there. This is nowhere else in the world is such a largest conservation area not even had an inventory. People don't even know what's there, and yet it's being destroyed as we speak. So how much of the rock art has been destroyed already? No one's quite sure. Um, some as high as 10%, some as high as 20%. Percents are nothing when, when you're talking about rock art. Um, some say 5,000, some say 10,000. But what is interesting from all our reports is each individual rock art is done, is significant. So we were, we were once planning, um, well, could we give up a bit? Could we say, well, you can destroy so much rock art because there's plenty of it around? Recent studies indicate that this is a continuous cultural landscape, that you can't isolate individual pieces of rock art. If, for example, you'd use a comparison in European terms, you have a group of Rembrandts in one area and a Mona Lisa by itself. Go ahead and destroy the Mona Lisa because we have all those Rembrandts. I mean, it just doesn't happen. We've heard this morning that there have been a plethora of studies, draft studies, half-baked studies, incredibly expensive full-scale studies. Um, at no stage has the EPA or the museum's department been involved in doing any full study of the Dampier Archipelago or the borough. And still to date, the EPA is only able to assess a project on a project basis, not the land use system. Now if we conclude, um, and this is just a conjecture, if we conclude that we have lost